أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ ابتلى إبراهيم ربه بكلمات فأتمهن قال إني جاعلك للناس إماما قال ومن ذريتي قال لا ينال عهد الظالمين وإذ جعلنا البيت مثابة للناس وأمنا واتخذوا من مقام إبراهيم مصلى وعهدنا إلى إبراهيم وإسماعيل أن طهر بيتي للطائفين للطائفين والعاكفين والركع السجود وإذ قال إبراهيم رب جعل هذا بلدا آمنا ورزق أهله من الثمرات من آمن منهم بالله واليوم الآخر قال ومن كفر فأمتعه قليلا ثم أضطره إلى عذاب النار وبئس المصير رب الشح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم ما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى tonight's topic is something that um, I feel very personally uh, hurt about by Allah's permission and his favor I've had the opportunity to travel to about 80 or so communities all over the United States in the last five years and I've made about two week stops at each community, alhamdulillah. Uh, and, you know, I, I was a youth that was raised in New York. And, you know, when you live in one place for a long time, you kind of, you don't know what's going on in the world outside of that little bubble of yours, you know. So as I traveled a lot outside, it was a, in some ways a very eye-opening experience. In some respects, it was something that I had never expected. On the other, you know, on the other side, it was very positive. But on the other hand, at the same time, I came to observe that there are certain problems that the Muslim community has that it doesn't matter if they're in California, or they're in Boston, or they're in Texas, or they're in Arkansas, they're the same. They're the same. And one of those problems that's probably, to me at least, the most pressing issue of all of the issues is the problem of how rapidly we are losing our youth how rapidly we are losing connection with our kids. And inshallah ta'ala in this talk, though I want to start with the importance of this topic, from the point of view of Allah's book himself, so, uh, you know, subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to share with you the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam, just to give us an overview of the importance of this matter. <coughs> and towards the end, I will share with you some, some things from my experience, and some thoughts that I have on this subject. I don't claim to have solutions. And I really, uh, honestly, I don't claim to say anything that probably hasn't been said before. But my hopes are, really in the end, you cannot even hope to solve a problem until you're aware of the problem. So the first step really is, we have to be cautious and aware and accept that there is in fact a problem. And the next step is, we have to put our heads together, and we have to seek out solutions, of course, in light of Allah's book and the sunnah of His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but then among, with shura among ourselves, as concerned, as, as people of shared concern, how do we take the next step, how do we you know, come to some conclusions? But the very first big step, before you even talk about medicine is, you have to convince the patient that he's sick. If he doesn't think he's sick, he doesn't need any medicine. He's not even going to concern himself. I'm finding out what prescription should I need to be on, you know? So now I began with these few ayat from Al-Baqarah. And I want to go quickly on a very quick dars of these ayat and a reminder from these ayat. By no means are these an, ex, you know, uh, an elaborate tafsir of these ayat. Just some brief reminder. 
Ibrahim alayhi salam went through many, many, many trials. Whenever Hajj season comes close, you hear the khutbah about Ibrahim alayhi salam and the many enormous feats that he accomplished. And when he accomplished all of those incredible things, at the end of all of them, Allah Azza wa Jal gave him his certificate. And this ayah is about the certificate. Allah Azza wa Jal says to him, uh, tells us, وَإِذْ إِبْتَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتِ فَأَتَمَّهُنَّ When Allah, when his Lord tested Ibrahim alayhi salam, especially Ibrahim alayhi salam, thoroughly, ibtila, ibtala Ibrahim. And at the end of all those tests, he completed all of them. فَأَتَمَّهُنَّ He completed every last one of those tests. قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامَ At the end of passing all of those tests, Allah Azza wa says to Ibrahim alayhi salam, there is no doubt I am installing you as an imam over people. I am making you a leader over people. I am making you a role model for humanity. This is the certificate, this is the honor, this is the, you know, the, the medal of honor that is being given to Ibrahim alayhi salam after he went through some very difficult tests. We can't even begin to imagine a human being going through the kinds of tests that Ibrahim alayhi salam had to go through. Like you know, we, we, we say it so easily that he jumped into a fire. We say it so easily that he put a knife to his kid's neck. You, your child is holding a fork in their hand and you say, hey, take, put that down, it's dangerous. You know, you get nervous. If your child is too close to the stove, what happens to you? And here you have this man putting a knife and going at his, his own son's neck, subhanAllah. It's easy to say, it's very difficult to even put, try to put yourself in that position, it's unfathomable. Then the fact that he has to leave his family in the middle of a desert, certain death, certain death. Our families, when we leave them, for example, you have to pick your family up at the airport. I was telling the students this earlier today, right? You, you, you got late to pick them up from the airport. You get like 20 voicemails. Right? And you're worried, where are you? Is everything okay? Everything alright? You know, they're in an air-conditioned well-secured, you know, bench somewhere sitting in, the, in this airport facility and you're, you're losing your mind. And here you have Ibrahim alayhi salam leaving his wife and child in the middle of a desert where you could see the only thing waiting for them is death. That's the only thing waiting for them. And yet he can walk away from all of that in, with tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not an easy thing. So he goes through all of these tests, Allah says, you've passed. You are now imam over humanity. And you know, this, these, these tests, like we said, they're not easy. But something we should know about Ibrahim alayhi salam, when everything, when anything comes to him, when anything happens, good or bad, anything happens to him, who does he remember first? Allah azza wa First, the first thing that comes to his mind is Allah azza wa This is why we find, find the monologue of Ibrahim alayhi salam that some of the students we went through today in the seminar. الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينَ He's the one who created me. Ibrahim says this alayhi salam. He's the one who created me. He's the one. It is he who guides me. وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينِي He is the one who gives me to eat. He is the one who lets me drink. وَإِذَا مَلِطْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينِي Whenever I becomes, whenever I have become sick in the past, he is the one who cures me. So now, everything that happens in his life, what does he, who does he remember? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you would expect when Allah gives him the greatest gift of all, the greatest gift of all in the life of a man is Allah says to him that he's happy with you. That Allah says he's happy with you. So Allah says to Ibrahim alayhi salam, I have made you imam over people. What do you expect Ibrahim alayhi salam to say? We expect him to say, Alhamdulillah ya Rabbi. Praise be to you. Oh, gratitude be to you. This honor for me. This humble slave of yours. Instead, you find the response of Ibrahim alayhi salam, qala, he said, wa min dhurriyati. What about my kids? And dhurriya is different from abna'i or awladi. Dhurriya means future generations. What about my immediate children and their children and their children and their children? What about them? Allah made him imam over mankind, he's worried about his future generations. He's thinking three, four generations, five generations, ten, twenty, thirty generations in advance. This is the mindset of genius. This is the mindset of someone who truly understands their role in this world. You know, the Muslim is unlike the non-Muslim in many ways. And one of the ways in which we're different is the way we think about things. We think long term. And I don't mean long term like think about your future or get into a mortgage. That's not the long term I'm talking about. Well, long term we're talking about getting into that house that Allah built for us where you don't have to pay a mortgage, that house. We think that long term. We think generations in advance. We, the, Muslim, the believer will be like 80 years old. 
ready to die any day now and he's still planting a seed in the ground that one day a tree will grow and somebody will get its shade. He's not going to live to see that, day, that tree but he's worried about the future. That's how we are, sadaqa jariya. We're continued worried about the future. We're worried about the future. That's how we're supposed to be. But because we are so engulfed in a society that doesn't care about the future, like a small example of how this society doesn't care about the future before we go on, is the consumption of riba. You know, some of the wealthiest people in this country are people that become rich through what? Through riba, through the, the interest economy. And the easy, is, I'm not going to give you a lecture on finance, but very simply speaking, you have a, like a Donald Trump. This guy, one of the richest people in the world, right? If he paid all of his debts right now, if he paid every last one of his debts right now, guess what? Not even zero, minus in the millions. He pays the minimum payment on this property, minimum on that one, minimum on that one, rents all of them out, then refinances, then goes to another property. He's got debt upon debt upon debt upon debt upon debt and making minimum payments on all of them, probably like a 300 year mortgage before he pays everything off. Is he gonna die before that? He figures, I'm gonna live it up. When after I die, it's somebody else's problem, what do I care? This is the mentality of someone who doesn't believe in the akhirah. Live it up, who cares what everybody else... I'm not worried about them, I'm worried about me. So you know Al Gore is crying about global warming in 50 years. Who cares, I'm gonna die in 10, I don't care. It's not my problem. You know, national debt, our children will be in national debt. Who cares about our children, we got our problems now. So this is a society that is that's the, the hallmark of the human condition. You love to get things quickly. You don't think long term. But Allah Azza wa conditions us in His book to think long term. So when we come to this country, you know, and Allah Muslims, they come to this country, uh, um, a lot of them immigrants, a lot of them even indigenous, when we think the idea of long term, we think where is my child going to go to school? Where are they going to go to college? When are we going to buy a house? This is long term for us. I'm talking about a different long term. How will I make sure that my future generations, three, four, five generations from now, how do I make sure they'll be saying La ilaha illallah and they'll be teaching La ilaha illallah to others? How do I do that? That's long term thinking. If your kids graduate from school and get a nice degree and get a great job and marry the right rich family and all of that, right? And then they lose La ilaha illallah in just one generation. Have you succeeded or failed? Think about that. Who's going to answer for that? Ibrahim salam understands this. So when Allah said, you're the Imam, He said, that's not enough. I'm responsible for my children. And if, I, if they don't become good, then their children will be worse, and their children will be worse. And on the Day of Judgment, who am I tied to? The whole generation of, of failures. I don't want to be answerable for them, no matter how many good deeds a person does. If you, let's just imagine you did millions and millions and millions of mountains of good deeds. If you didn't raise your children properly, and they lost this deen, whether in aqidah, in their beliefs, or in their practice, they lost this deen. When they get married and have children, are they going to teach the deen? No. And then what about two, three generations from now? Are they going to, they're going to teach their religion? No. So now you're going to have generation after generation being born of disbelievers, that started with your irresponsibility. Right? On the Day of Judgment, with all of your good deeds, can you compete with all of those bad deeds put together? There's no way. There's no way. This is a very heavy burden placed upon a parent. Every parent is an Imam. Every father here is an Imam over people. The Imamah that Allah gave to Ibrahim salam, whose Imamship was he worried about first? Over his own children. His own children first. So Allah says, Allah responds to his dua, He said, قَالَ لَا يَنَالُ عَهْدِ الظَّالِمِينَ He said, what about my kids? Allah said, no, my guarantee doesn't extend to wrongdoers. Allah told Ibrahim salam, in between the lines, some of your kids are going to be wrongdoers. Not all of them are going to be righteous. And we know the vast majority of the children of Ibrahim salam are wrongdoers. Aren't the Quraysh the children of Ibrahim salam? They are. Were they wrongdoers? Sure. Sure. And for generations. Now Ibrahim salam, he hears this answer and I'm sure it would have hurt him. That Allah said, that my guarantee is not extended to wrongdoers. What do you mean? What does he do next? Does he give up? No. He, goes, he comes back to Allah, counter dua, you see. Now we, the next thing we read is, Ibrahim alayhi salam was skipping an ayah just because of a, a brief time inshaAllah. وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ جَعَلْ هَذَا بَلَدًا آمِنًا He's been assigned to build the house of Allah. So as he's, as he's approaching the house, he makes dua, 
O my Lord, make this a peaceful city. Make this a peaceful city. وَرْزُقْ أَهْلَهُ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ And provide its children from all kinds of provision. Okay, provide its people from all kinds of fruits. So he made two part dua so far. He said, make sure the city is safe. بَلَدًا آمِنًا And the second thing, that they get all kinds of fruit. In English literature, we call this peace and prosperity. You ever heard that phrase before? Peace and prosperity. And in political science, you learn that for a society to function, the first thing you need is law and order, which is peace. If your house is not safe, if your store is not safe, if your office is not safe, if your money is not safe, then you can't function in that society. But even if you have peace, if there's no jobs, if there's no way to make money, if there's no way to run your business, then is that society going to survive? No. So you need peace and you need what? Prosperity. This is what you learn in political science now. Look at the genius of this man's dua. He says, make this a peaceful city and make sure they're provided for from all kinds of fruit. But then he adds a little bit of a disclaimer in the end. He says, وَرْزُقْ أَهْلَهُ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ مَنْ آمَنَ مِنْهُمْ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ He says, only provide the, the, the children of mine who believe in Allah in the last day. Allah said to him, not all, not, my, my guarantee is not extended to wrongdoers. He responded, okay, make this a great city, make its people enjoy all kinds of provision, make them well off, but only make the believing ones well off. In other words, I would rather the, the, the disbelieving, the wrongdoing children, I would rather they starve off and their generations discontinue, because I don't want to answer for them. I only want to answer for my believing children. You see the genius in the dua? Subhanallah. مَنْ آمَنَ مِنْهُمْ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Only the ones who believe in Allah in the last day. Allah responded again, قَالَ وَمَنْ كَفَرَا فَأُمَتِّعُهُ قَلِيلًا Allah said, by the way, the one, even, even the one who disbelieved, I'm going to give him a little too. I'm going to let him have some enjoyment also. ثُمَّ أَطُرُّهُ إِلَىٰ عَذَابِ النَّارِ Then I'm going to drag him into the punishment of the fire. وَبِئْسِ الْمَصِيرِ Stern words from Allah Azza wa Jal. What a horrible place that is to go to. So now Ibrahim alayhi salam, first he asked for his children, Allah said, not everybody. Then he asked, only feed my believing children. No, no, I'll feed the disbelieving children too. And then I'll drag them into hellfire. Ibrahim alayhi salam's dua has been countered twice. Does he give up now? No. You see, this is a concerned father. So we, we, we read further. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُوا إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَاسْمَعِي Ibrahim alayhi salam is building the foundations of the house. But does he do it alone? Who does he include? Ismail. Ismail. And you know, this is, this is part of the genius of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When you ask Allah for something, and this is advice especially to younger people, you're not praying, you're not remembering Allah, you're not concerned about your obligations to Allah, you're not lowering your gaze, but your, your final exam is tomorrow, and like five minutes before you haven't studied, Ya Allah, the midterm. You know, all of a sudden you remember Allah. This is, you know, remembering Allah by convenience. Right? By convenience. The best time to ask Allah for something is when you do something that makes Allah happy with you. It's the best time to ask. You know what's the, one of the best times for dua is what time? After salah. You just obeyed Allah, now ask dua. One of the best places to ask dua is the house of Allah. When you go there, it's a great act of obedience. Now is the best time to ask. The best time to ask dua, the, the, the last portion of the night. Because that's the, when you're showing obedience to Allah in the best possible way. The best time to ask dua is Ramadan because you're obeying Allah at that time. Ask Allah at that time. So now Ibrahim alayhi salam is doing one of the greatest acts of obedience to Allah. He is building Allah's house on this earth. With his son. This is probably the best time to ask again. Right? So he asks again. But he knows what Allah has said no to already, so he's going to keep modifying his dua. Because he, he's adjusting accordingly. So what dua does he make? Number one dua. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Our Lord, accept from us. You see, in the previous dua, it was Rabbi. Rabbi ja'al hadha. My Lord, make this a peaceful city. Rabbi is my Lord. Now he said what? Our Lord. Who does he include? His son. He's like, this time, I'm building Allah's house, I'm going to make dua, but I'm going to include my son in the dua. So at least guarantee me this boy right here. Rabbana, taqabbal minna, accept from both of us. Innaka anta sami'ul alim. No doubt you are the one who, who hears everything, he knows everything. Subhanallah. So he ensures at least one son. 
Then he noticed the next ayah is a continuation of the du'as, which means Allah did not respond with words. When Allah does not respond, it's silence, and silence means what? Acceptance. Right? So Allah accepted that du'a. So he goes further. <laughs> He doesn't stop. If Allah accepted, might as well keep going. رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ Our Lord, make both of us in complete submission to you. Make us Muslim before you. Accept us first. In complete submission before you. By the way, Allah has already made him Imam because of what? Because of his submission. Hasn't he already submitted? Subhanallah, why is he asking this dua? Because now he's including his son. Make us in complete submission before you. رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ And out of our children, not all of our children, but out of our children, because the min here indicates a fraction, right? At least some of our children guarantee that they will be a Muslim ummah, an ummah, a group, a nation, that only submits to you, no one else. أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ a, a, a group that will only submit to you. Okay, some of my children will be wrongdoers, but at least guarantee me some of them. Don't guarantee me, okay, you didn't guarantee me all of them, guarantee me some of them. Ummatan Muslimatan lak. And those that will be in complete submission to you, wa arina manasikana, and show us our rituals. We've built your house, we don't know how to please you, how do we worship you at this house? How do we make tawaf? How do we make salah? Teach us these things. Show us our rituals. Wa arina manasikana, wa tub alayna, and accept our tawbah. You know when you ask for tawbah? When you do a sin. You ask for tawbah when you do something wrong. Why is he asking for tawbah? Tawbah alayna. Has he done anything wrong? This is one of the greatest messengers from the Ulul Azm, alayhi salam. What tawbah is he making? This is a profound lesson. When you do something for the sake of Allah, like we just prayed, did we make mistakes in our prayer? Was there shortcomings in our wudu? Were there shortcomings in where our mind wandered? What's for dinner? They said there's going to be dinner. You know? So when you come up from ruku, your belly gets a little stretch and you say, hmm, <laughs> I hope they have rice. You know? <laughs> That's going on in your head. So now, does that, is that a shortcoming in the salah? Absolutely. So be, just because you prayed doesn't mean you performed the best prayer. You should ask Allah to, ex- to repent to Allah for the shortcomings and even the things you do for Him. He's building Allah's house and he's, he's humility. The humility of this man. I'm building your house, maybe I didn't put a brick where I was supposed to. Maybe I, did, maybe I made a mistake, I'm not, I don't even know if I made. So if I'm making a mistake that I don't even know I made, I'm still admitting my fault. What to alayna. Accept our tawbah. Subhanallah. And this is, the, some, this is an attitude we have to learn from Ibrahim alayhi salam. We ask people to make istighfar. Man, I haven't done anything wrong, man. Why am I making istighfar? Shoot, you've done plenty wrong. We've done plenty wrong, whether we know it or not. وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ So he makes tawbah. But then there's no response from Allah. What does that mean again? Acceptance. So he keeps going. He says, رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ he, he thinks carefully about what Allah has told him. And he calculates his words. And he says to Allah, our Lord, appoint from our future generations a messenger who is from among them. Not just a messenger, but a messenger who is from among them. This is genius. If you just ask for a messenger, and he's from the outside, then people will say, I don't want to listen to you, you foreigner. People don't like listening to foreigners. When those of you that come from Pakistan or India, when your kids are totally American, and they go to Pakistan, nobody listens to them. They make fun of how they talk. And when somebody comes from the Arab world, or Sudan, or Indonesia, or Malaysia, and they don't speak any English, they come here, and they try to make da'wah. People listening to them or no? They're not listening. They're not from here. They're outsiders. So, an, uh, in any region, an outsider is looked at as less relevant. Less relevant. They, they can't be a leader. They're from the outside. So he makes du'a that a messenger should be from among them, from within them. So that when he talks, they listen. What's the point of having a messenger if people don't listen? So, minhum yatlu alayhim ayatik. And not just a messenger, he will read onto them your miraculous signs. He will read onto them something that will mesmerize them and bring them closer to you. So that they stay in line, they stay Muslim. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ And he will teach them the book, and he will teach them wisdom. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And he will cleanse them, he will purify them. 
This is a well thought out dua of Ibrahim salam, And we all know, we've learned this from childhood. The response of this dua is the advent of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you understand the power of dua? Ibrahim salam made this dua with what motive? What was his motivation? His motivation was my children. My children. When a concerned father makes sincere dua to his Lord, then the Lord responds. The dua of Ibrahim salam is responded with the greatest response humanity has ever seen. It is the advent of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So do not underestimate the power of dua. Do not underestimate the power of dua. The revelation of the Qur'an that we are reading now is a response to a dua. It's a response, think about that, it's a response to a dua. The hundreds and millions, if not billions of people that have said La ilaha illallah since the coming of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa all over this world, generation after generation is the response to a dua. It's the response to the, one day they will, Allah will cleanse, He will cleanse them. He will purify them. He will read the book onto them. This is the concern of a father who thinks ahead. He thinks ahead. So Allah tells us, and this is what I'm going to conclude with and talk about some other practical stuff inshallah now. وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَنْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ Who is going to walk away from the legacy of Ibrahim? Who's going to t- turn his back, turn away from the legacy of Ibrahim? Who would be that dumb? إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِهَ نَفْسَهُ Except the one who is fooling himself. The only one to walk away from this legacy is the one who is fooling himself. وَلَقَدْ إِسْطَفَيْنَاهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ we had selected him in this world and in the, in the hereafter, truly he is from the righteous. Alayhi salam. So this brief passage I shared with you because it's the passage in the Qur'an about parenthood. About concern for the future generation. And the passage is in that. Might as well just do two more ayat inshaAllah. وَوَصَّيْنَا وَوَصَّى بِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بَنِيهِ وَيَعْقُوبُ Ibrahim alayhi salam and Yaqub May gave a will, gave a legacy to their children. What was the legacy? Ya Baniya, Inna Allah astafa lakum al-din, fala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. My children, there is no doubt about it. It is Allah who has preferred and given selection of this deen to you. He's preferred it for you. Then don't you dare die except that you are in complete submission to Allah. Our times, the parent turns to the child, don't you dare get less than a 90 in math. Don't you dare ever go with those friends again. Don't you dare do this, don't you dare do that. What's he saying to his children? Don't you dare die until you are, unless you are in complete submission to Allah. You know, this is, this is something Allah has, this is a gift Allah has chosen for you. This is Allah's gift to you, this la ilaha illallah. Don't you dare lose it. This is the advice of concerned fathers. And by the way, this is the beauty of the dua. He said, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا Which son was with him? Which was with Ismail alayhi salam. But the next Prophet mentioned is who? Ya'qub. Ya'qub alayhi salam. Ya'qub alayhi salam is the son of who? Ishaq. The son who was not there. So Allah didn't only answer the dua for that son and his progeny. He answered the dua for Ishaq to come in his progeny too. From among them, he answered the prayer too. And even they grew up to be concerned fathers. So Yaqub alayhi salam is one of the greatest fathers in history, who's talked about as a role model father in our book. So, um, last one. Am kuntum shuhada'a id hadara Yaqub al maut Were you around? Did you all see when death came to Yaqub? When death presented itself to Yaqub alayhi salam? Now imagine this old man on his deathbed, and all of his sons around him, taking care of him, giving him water, crying, and he's worried about them. He's not worried about who you're going to marry or where you're going to live. What are you going to do with the property? Make sure you pay your taxes. None of that stuff. Nothing. Nothing. Make sure you finish college. No concerns. On his deathbed, he says, Ya Baniya. Oh, my, my children, my sons. Inna Allah has lakum al-deen. There's no doubt about it. It is Allah who has selected the deen for you. Fala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Don't you dare die. Except. You, that you're Muslim. And then he says, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي What are you going to worship after I'm gone? What are you going to do after I'm gone? What are you going to worship after I'm gone? And he didn't even say, مَنْ تَعْبُدُونَ He said, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ Which illustrates, he's quizzing them. What is it that you're going to do? What form of worship are you going to take? And they responded, نَعْبُدُ إِلَهَكَ وَإِلَهَا بَعِكَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ إِلَهًا وَاحِدًا وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ 
we will worship your ilah and the ilah of your fathers, Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, and we are Muslim completely to him. Now I'm going to close Mus'haf, inshallah ta'ala, and share some practical realities in contrast. Let's compare ourselves to what has just been learned. This is a story of old times. These are great children. At the end of this passage, you know what Allah says? Tilka ummatun qad khalat. That's a nation, they're already gone. They're already, they, they're past. Laha ma kasabat, that group, that nation earned what they earned. Walakum ma kasabtum. And you will get what you earned. You don't just think about them and say, oh, those were the good times. No, 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 no. They got what they got. You will have to earn what you what you earn. You will have what you earn. وَلَا تُسْأَلُونَ عَمَّا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ You will not be interrogated about what they used to do. What, you, what will you be interrogated about? What you did. Allah's words at the end are, learn the lesson and change yourself. You won't be asked about whether you know the historical names and figures and dates. And can you name all the sons of Yaqub or not? السلام, what will you be asked? What did you do with your children? What did you do? Now, I, I, inshallah ta'ala, very briefly, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of things that are plaguing our ummah today. You know, we have to understand the time in which we live. If we want to understand the teachings of our deen, we have to understand Quran and Sunnah, and we also have to have a good understanding of when we are living, where we are living, what is around us, what's happening in the society around us. That actually happens to be a statement of Ibrahim alayhi salam that we find. That a man must know the age in which he lives. There's something we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be aware of our surroundings. You know, the Muslims today, the vast majority of them have lost touch with their religion. And they've become more concerned with the practices of their tradition of the family than they are with the religion. Okay, they're, they're more concerned with their culture than they are with the religion. So when their young son or daughter becomes a little bit religious and says, I want to get married, but I want the nikah to be in the masjid. The father says, are you crazy? We don't do that in our family. We'll get a hall. And he's, the son says, or the daughter says, I want the gathering to be separate. I don't want men and women mixing. No, 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 we don't do that in our culture. This is extreme, you're, you're turning into a crazy person. So, we're not, don't be crazy like that. That's not how we do things in our family. That's not our tradition. Have you heard that before? That's not our tradition. Okay, that's not your tradition. If you're, for example, from the Indo-Pak or the Arab society, right? That's not your tradition. But what about your fathers and their fathers and their fathers and their fathers? If you go back seven or eight generations, your great 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 grandfather would have said the same thing that this youth is saying. So whose truth is the tradition? <laughs> who's upholding the tradition? And who's defying the tradition? These, these ideas of we don't do things this way, we don't act like this, this is the hypnosis that the colonizers put on the Ummah of Islam. They came and put these clothes on us, they taught us how to eat with a fork and spoon, right? To know that English is the language of the dignified and Arabic is the language of people who don't really get a good education, right? They taught us this stuff. And then we got so hypnotized into thinking this is our way. This is our way. SubhanAllah. We have to have a sense of dignity for who we are, for what our legacy is. Our legacy is not 50 years old. And this is the other thing that happened to this ummah. It is part of our problem today. We think our history, those of you that are from Pakistan, oh, we're a, we're a tradition of 50 years ago, or 70 years ago, right? Or we're a 100 year old country, we're a 200, no, we're a 1400 year old plus ummah. Those lines were not drawn by Muslims, who were they drawn by? By kuffar, by the enemies of Islam. Don't think that's our tradition, our tradition is much bigger than that. Don't limit yourself. Now, having said all of that, let's come back to the United States where we live. In our children, yes, our children are being raised in this society. They're being raised literally as Americans. You like biryani and baklava and whatever you like, they like pizza. You don't like pizza, right? They like, they like a cheeseburger. You can't stand it. And the things that you laugh at, they don't laugh at. And the things you, the, the things you eat for sweets, they're allergic to. They'd rather have a candy, a chocolate bar, or something, right? It's a different culture. The, what they like to eat, how they speak, what they like, what, how they entertain themselves is different from you. The elders are sitting together and they're listening to poetry from old times and going, oh, that's good stuff. And their youth, I don't know what they're talking about, man. I have no idea. And he's, he's got 50 cent on or, you know. Different worlds. Two completely different worlds. 
So now we, not only do we have an, a, a generation gap between ourselves and our children, we have a continental gap. <laughs> Right? Our parents are from a different continent, a different world, where things work entirely differently. But what's happened, and this is my assessment of it, what's happened is, when we come to the United States, we've built these masajid, Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward those, we put even a penny in the building of the masajid, because if it wasn't for the building of the masajid, we would not be sitting here today. There would be no da'wah this time. So we reward, we, we ask Allah to reward the people who spend even a penny for the sake of Allah and building His house. Right? So this is, this is a great contribution to this ummah. But then what happened is the problem too. Let's talk about the problem too. Let's not only talk about the good, let's talk about the bad too. So we built our masajid, and then right now when you, when you turn on Sinat, it's America. And when you turn into a, the parking lot and you park your car, now we're in Pakistan. And when you enter in here, it's Cairo or, or, or Lahore or Hyderabad in here. We've left America. We're in a different country here. Right? And we act that way too. We, you would never do the things you would do in a, in a, a masjid bathroom in any other bathroom <laughs> you would never park your car in any other parking lot the way you park it at the masjid because you're in Pakistan when you get in here <laughs> right? It's the, it's the mentality of the Muslim we, we, we're, we're, so this is an island where we own what's back, it's like back nostalgia from back home now the thing is back home things were a little different the imam would come he would give a dafs in Arabi he would give a lecture in Urdu, or in Bangla, or in Malay, or in Thai, or, or, or like in Turkish, right? And you would listen and you would enjoy. Is that going to work here? Well, how's that going to work here? And you know why the, the biggest proof that it doesn't work here? The, sh the shuyukh are here, the great scholars are here, and they're wonderful. But when they're talking, who's listening? The elders are listening. Where are their kids? Outside in the parking lot, out in the basketball court. It's a great court, by the way. Right? They're, they're in the court. They're not here. They're not here. And masjid after masjid after masjid is having fight over who should be the imam of the masjid. Should it be from this country? Should it be from that country? Should it be from this madrasa or that madrasa? Should it be from this ideology or that ideology? No matter who you get, guess who doesn't care? Your kids. They don't care. They couldn't care less. So we're fighting over things that don't make any sense. We've left the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We've left it. Are his primary concern is who? His children. His ch what do we do in this masjid? And every masjid in the United States, what do we do at our masajid that turns this a magnet for young people? Turns this into a place where young people her herd. They flock to it. Instead of a place that they run away from. Instead of a place that they run away from. This is the first concern. And by the way, just to add a little bit of irony to all of this, Ibrahim alayhi salam was building what? When he asked for those future generations, he was building Allah's house. Allah's house has directly something to do with preserving the future generations. If you lose connection with Allah's house, you've lost everything. You've lost everything. The masajid in this country are our refuge. Our refuge. Our youth. Now let's talk a little bit about the youth and what their problems are. They're probably the, the number one catastrophe of our youth is they have no one to talk to. That's the number one catastrophe of our youth. Your child goes to school. Let's say they go to public school, that's the majority of Muslims, they, they put their children in public school because they can't afford Islamic school or whatever reason, right? We don't blame them for it, that's their circumstance. So they put their children in public school, by fifth or sixth grade, their ch your children learn some pretty filthy vocabulary in this country. I don't care what state you're from, right? There's some pretty dirty vocabulary. They learn how to access some pretty disgusting websites. They learn how to download some pretty hideous things on their PSPs and iPod videos or, or, or iPod touches or, or iPhones or whatever. So they're pretty advanced but at a very early age. Things you would never have learned until you were 25, they know when they're 12. That's the reality. That's what's going on today. So, how many parents here know what Facebook is? You guys know what Facebook is? Show of hands, please. Okay, Twitter. You know what Twitter is? It's not when your eye bugs out. Something else. Okay, so, so your kids are on these social networking sites where, they have, they, they're, where, where predators, literally predators, have access to talk to your teenage daughter or to your son and to, to engage in relationships with them over, over the internet and eventually they meet up with them and things happen. This is a reality of the Muslim youth today. This is happening. This, we shouldn't close our eyes to it. We need to open our eyes to it. And you say to yourself, nah, not my kids. Nah, not, not my, no, please, wake up. 
don't, and some basic solutions, before we talk about the bigger picture and what we need to do at the massage, some basic solutions do not have open access internet at home, especially when you have children under the age of 12. Do not. That is a horrible idea. Do not give your children a laptop. Do not give them a machine, a phone, that has anything but phone numbers. No texting. Don't, don't give them text message phones. Don't give them internet access phones. You are asking for trouble. You are asking for trouble. You will regret what you did later on. You think you got them these things because you love them? You are destroying them. You are destroying them. They are not smart enough to figure out, I shouldn't be doing that or I shouldn't be doing this. Don't assume that they will make all the good decisions because you come from a nice family. Please don't fall into that trap. For Allah's sake, take those things away. There are other ways to entertain your children. So this is the first thing. When your children become teenagers, by the way, which happens a lot, right? Our children become teenagers. And as I travel the country, you know what happens with a lot of parents? They come to me and they say, I have a teenage girl. I have a teenage boy. I want you to talk to him. This has happened to me hundreds of times. Literally hundreds of times. And you know why they come to me? And I don't, I don't judge anyone. I don't judge anyone. Wallahi, I don't judge anyone. You know why they come? Because when they're teenagers, they become independent. And when they become independent, they no longer listen to you. When they no longer listen to you, you have to find somebody that they will listen to. The ship has already sailed. When was your chance? When was your chance? Before they turned into to semi-adults. That was your chance. Take, don't lose that opportunity. The thing that we have to learn here is, we're in a different world. The way you deal with your children back home is not the way you deal with them here. They're two different things. Back home you can yell at them, slap them, do whatever. It's all good. That's how everybody does it. Over here you yell at them a little, they'll go and talk, my, yeah, my dad, he's a total loser. They'll talk about, you, you like that. They will, among the friends, they will talk. I used to run a Sunday school, I was the, the head of a Sunday school, and my job, primary job, you know what it was? It was to be a spy. That was my prime. it wasn't curriculum, or am I teaching aqidah, or what textbooks to order, no, 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 no. That will come later. Let me go around during recess and spy on the conversations these kids are having. My mom let me buy an NC-17 video game, and I'm only eight. She loves me. No, she doesn't. <laughs> I have Grand Theft Auto, whatever, 85 now, right? This is, and did you see that movie? It's PG-13, but I still got to go see it. Or it's rated R and I've seen it. We even have the DVD at home. This is what the kids are talking about. You're messing your kids up. You think you love them? This is love? This is what Ibrahim would he approve of anything near this? Anything near, this is concern for children? Wake up! Really, wake up! We've, we've you know, uh, exposed our children to things in this society, it's, it's gone progressively worse, in media especially. So a movie that was PG-13 10 years ago is PG now. Okay, the, the standards have dropped. They, they're talking about it, it's not even me, they're talking about it. Right? So, uh, and you know, for example, homosexuality and these kinds of filthy things have now become norm even in cartoons. Even, it's not Tom and Jerry anymore. Things have changed. Things have changed. We have to be aware of what's going on. What our children are watching. The kinds of language they're using. The things they find normal. The, f the things that have just become part of life. And you know when you come to the masjid and you see people with beards and making salah, and they're, you know, they're talking in a certain way, do, they, do your children see more of that or do, do they see the real world more? What the children see more is what they define as normal. So to your kids, in their head, this isn't normal. That's normal. And that's a problem. That's the real problem. They don't see this as normal. They see the outside world as normal. How do we change that for our children? How do we make this change happen for our children? This is really what I want to first be aware of this problem, and then let's talk about how to address this problem. What did I say the number one con catastrophe for our children is? They have no one to talk to. They have no one to talk to. When your child goes to public school and sees a boy and a girl together, or some, some girl comes up to your boy and says you want to go to the prom, or we're getting together at this restaurant, you want to come with me, you're kind of cute. This happens to your fifth grader. This happens to your seventh grader. Your girl, your boy, it happens to them. Are they going to come home and talk to you about it? No. My, hey, 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 dad, this girl told me I'm cute. What? Is this why we brought you to America? <laughs> slap, slap, you know, the works. This child knows. My parents can't handle that information. 
So he's got to talk to someone about it. Guess who he's going to talk to? He's going to talk to his friends. And if he's going to public school, are his friends Muslim or non-Muslim? They're non-Muslim, so when he talks to his non-Muslim friends, what kind of advice is he going to get? Muslim advice or non-Muslim advice? Non-Muslim advice. Go for it, man. That's what he's going to get. And now your children are confiding in their friends and not in you because you're too strict. You don't talk to them. You don't open that door for them. Because you're used to having that authority that your father had on you, but that was back home. This is here, man. This is different. It doesn't work like that. We have to befriend our children. We have, we have to let them open up to us. And this is a problem even for me. I'm a father of three daughters. Right? And I'm, you know, I'm a protective father. So when my daughter was in, in preschool, in preschool, there was a boy that sat next to her, and she came home and said, Hamza sat next to me today. And we colored together. And I said, what? You know? And my wife looked at me and said, just leave. <laughs> I'll talk to her. You leave. Because if I show anger now, then she'll know my dad doesn't like hearing about Hamza. So, next time Hamza does something or says something, is she going to tell me? No. So I've, I've actually chopped off my own foot when I said that. I have to learn how to deal with these things. It takes a little bit of tactics. It takes a little bit of patience to deal with our children. We put them here. It's not their fault. We put them here. We put them in that school. We put them in that environment. They didn't ask for it. We put them there. So if they're exposed to bad things, whose fault is it? Ours. So we have to take a little bit of responsibility and not just say, oh, how dare you say this? Or how dare you learn that word? Well, you put me in that school. You put me in that situation. You let me watch that movie. You didn't ask what friends I have and where they live and who their parents are and what, they, what we do when we get together. You didn't ask. That's your problem. So open up the doors of communication for your children. Open up those doors. Open them now before it's too late. Really, open them now before it's too late. Too many of our children have rebelled from their homes. Too many of our daughters have run away with boyfriends. Too many. Too many. And I know it's ugly to hear, but it's our reality. We have to face it. Too, too many of our sons have, have illicit relationships. You know, this is, this is a sick reality. We have to deal with this. And we can't just cry about it, we have to deal with it. So this is the first thing, open up the doors of communication with your children. The second thing, for your teenage children, I give you the example of Yaqub alayhi salam. We said he's a wonderful father. Did his, did his sons do real, something really messed up? They did. What did they do? You remember? They took his son, kidnapped him, dropped him in a ditch in the middle of the woods, and came back with a shirt with false blood on it. Did he know they were lying? Okay, so now here's a the situation. There's some young sons, and here's a father. The father knows they did something horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. Does he say, you scum, you better go back and get that. With the... Do you find any of that? What do you find? Fasabrun jameel. When I hear that response, I say, what kind of dad is he? Why didn't he yell at them? Why didn't he, you know? You know why? Because he's an ingenious father. A father who really t takes care of parenting knows what is the age to advise your children and what is the age when they have become independent. When no matter what I tell them, they're not going to listen. A father knows. So there's an age where the only thing you can do is what? Sabrun <laughs> Jameel. There's an age that comes where all that's left is Sabrun Jameel. That's it. That's all you can do. Because now the ship is sailed. They're on their own. They're on their own. So your job is before they get to that point. Now if they've gotten to that point, if you have teenage kids, then the best you can do is try to introduce them to better company. To try to, you know, first of all, you know, uh, uh, give life to the youth groups at the masajid. I don't care what problems they have. Still, give them life. And uh, my advice to youth groups in general is keep the boys and girls separate. Have two separate youth groups. Don't combine them because you're asking for trouble. If you're a teenage boy or girl living in this society, then you have been exposed to enough shameless bombardment of media that those ideas are constantly running in your mind. And when you get a bunch of 15, 16, 17 year old Muslim boys and girls together and they're having an Isla Islamic program, please, please, let's be realistic. That's not a good idea. There are, there, there's no way a teenage boy can tell me nothing crossed my mind this whole event. There's no way. There's no way. You know how you were when you were 16 and 17. So don't, don't think your children are any different. So my advice to youth groups is, separate the boys and girls. And I don't care what youth group it is. Wallahi, I don't care if it's mass youth, or it's crescent youth, or it's YM, or it's some other youth group you guys started, or it's an MSA, whatever it may be, support it. Help it out. Instead of telling me what problems they have, you have more problems. 
Don't tell me what problems they have. Tell me how can you make them better? How can you support them? How can you liven them? Because these are the refuge for your children. Your children, your teenage kids are not going to go listen to a sheikh. They're not. The vast majority of teenage Muslim teenagers wouldn't even listen to me. You think they listen to me just because I don't have an accent? No. They're not going to listen to me. They see this, they run. They run. That's the reality. Who will they talk to? Other kids their age. Youth groups are the lifeline of Islamic da'wah to our youth. They're the lifeline. If we don't support them, we're losing it. We're gonna, it doesn't matter who the imam is. It doesn't matter how big the masjid gets. It doesn't matter what color carpet finally won in the board meeting. It does, none of that matters. None of that matters. What will, the only thing that will matter is, do we have a vehicle by which we're bringing the youth back in to Islam? Well, they're bringing it back into the masjid. And then the next advice, piece of advice are community centers, Islamic centers all over the country. And these are my fathers and my uncles. These are my elders, my respected you know, elders that, that I love for the sake of Allah because of the time and the effort they put into building and, and maintaining these masajid. But my sincere advice is a bigger problem than getting an imam for the masjid is getting a youth director for the masjid. A brother youth director for the brothers and a sister youth director for the sisters. This is critical in our time. More than an imam. You know, you get an imam, you say he's a fadil, or he's a alim, or he's a mufti, or he's a mujtahid. He's got a degree in fiqh, is this and that or the other. He comes and he tells you something about his opinion in fiqh, and guess what most of the community does? I don't like his opinions. I'm going to go find another opinion on Google. Oh, Why did you hire him with that huge resume when you're not going to listen to the guy? <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's demented how we've become. We're not facing reality. Youth directors are far more important. Young brothers, young sisters in your own community, Houston's, mashallah, a hotbed of like energetic, really, really great potential youth. So you take a bunch of youth, you take a bunch of sisters that are studying Islam, a bunch of brothers, you say to one or two of them, we'll pay your college tuition, we'll take care of your college tuition, you become the youth director full time for our masjid, you make sure a program is being done every week, you make sure that we, you take the kids out for some basketball or ice cream or a trip to the beach or whatever, or, or overnight or whatever, every week something's going on, every two weeks something's going on. You take care of that, we'll take care of you. Because you're taking care of the children of our community. We have to think like this. We have to invest in people now. We have to invest in people. And there's no shortage of remarkable youth in Houston. Wallahi. And I hope, I mean, there's a shortage in other communities. I look around the masjid, I don't see any young people. Here, mashallah, there's, there's great potential in the youth, among the brothers and the sisters. So capitalize on it. Get over your, your fiqh debates, whether it's 8 taraweeh or 20 taraweeh, your children don't care. That's a bigger problem. We can worry about those problems when times are good. These aren't good times. <laughs> so whether Eid is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Our children are more important. They're more important. Whether the guy is Hanafi or Shafi'i or Maliki or whatever you think he is, that's less important right now. Our children are more important right now. Let's prioritize. Let's we really have the right priorities. If we don't take care of our children, these debates will die with us. And the next debates that are coming, if we don't take care of our children, has anybody heard of Irshad Manji? Right? There's a hundred thousand Irshad Manjis brewing. Right? When we don't take care of the Islam of our next generation, that's what happens. That's what's next. They're not just going to be in CNN, they're going to be board members at Masajid. If we don't take care of business now, think ahead. Think ahead. I was telling you in the, in, the, in the khutbah of the churches in New York City that didn't think ahead. And what are they turned into now? They're nightclubs. Churches turned into nightclubs in the heart of New York City. One of the oldest Catholic communities in the country. And still, that's, that's what ended up happening with them. So on the other hand, you have the masajid. I, I met this brother. Wallahi, when I met him, I just I went in a corner and I cried. I just cried. I met him in Las Vegas. And I was in Las Vegas for the Qur'an conference, don't get any ideas, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> this was a few years ago, I was at the Qur'an conference, and then this, there's this elderly fellow, he's about 80 some years old, he and his wife, uh, you know, a white couple, blonde, you know, blue eyes, really light skin, they're sitting next to each other at the Qur'an conference, and I'm sitting there, and I, just, I was curious where they came from, so I went over and I said, you know, how are you? He said, alaikum, as alaykum salam. So I was already surprised. Muslims, mashallah. So we started talking to them, and they said, yeah, well, what happened was, uh, you know, he, he told me his name, I, I forget his name, but it was some Russian or, 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 or some kind of uh, Slavic descent. But his great-grandfather was actually a Muslim. And he, their family came to the United States some 150 years ago. And in two generations, they lost Islam. 
right? And then they were raised as just another Christian family. And, uh, and he was doing research on his family tree. So he dug up some stuff in his attic and found out that his great-grandfather was actually a scholar of Islam. And then he started looking into Islam and he found truth in it and took the shahada reviving his great-grandfather's tradition and his wife came to Islam too. And then they, they live in Massachusetts somewhere. So they decide they're going to buy a Humvee and they're going to travel the entire country stopping at every masjid they find. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And they, they were in Vegas at that point. SubhanAllah. But you know, Allah guided these people, Allah had written that for them. But you know that alim that came, who came to the US, do you think he intended that his children would lose Islam one day? And he didn't. And he didn't think that was a problem maybe. Just like we think it's not, you're making a big deal out of nothing. If you could just see 50 years in advance, if you could just see 50 years in advance, the, the last thing I'll share with you inshallah and we'll open it up to some discussion we can have together bi'idhnillah is a social statistic this uh, a social statistic was conducted by sociologists about the orthodox Jewish community in the east coast of the United States you know in New York and other places like Massachusetts uh, the Jewish community, the orthodox Jewish community is very strong right? Uh, some parts of Brooklyn you feel like you're driving in Tel Aviv right? that's how it feels so now, in that strong Jewish community, the sociological analysis was, in 60 years, there will be no Hasidic Jews in New York. In 60 years. That's not a long time. And they're far more organized than we are. And they have far more in infrastructure and yeshiva institute. I used to live in Forest Hills, and in a 12, 12 13 block uh, street, there's like six synagogues. They're very organized. And they're very, they have infrastructure, right? And the claim is, they're losing their youth. And in 60 years, there won't be any left. They're going to lose their orthodoxy, their, their traditional Judaism. They're going to lose it in this country. That's the claim that's being made, subhanAllah. And that's a community that's much older than we are, and much more organized than we are, and much better funded than we are, because riba is not a problem. Right? But on our side, subhanAllah, we have much less resources. We only have tawakkul in Allah. Again, I, I started with it, I end with it. Don't underestimate the power of dua. Do not underestimate the power of dua. But we have to now start thinking big, bigger. We have to start thinking, how do we solve this problem? How do we connect to our children? How do we open the doors of the masajid to make the children a better place? Of the people that are going to be watching this on video, inshallah, if your, if your masjid does not have a basketball court, get a basketball court. A professional one. If, raise the funds for that first before the chandelier. The chandelier can wait. It'll be off most of the time anyway, because you're going to whine that it causes too much electricity bills. So don't worry about the chandelier. Worry more about the basketball court. Worry more about the soccer field. Worry more about the sports facilities that the kids can come hang out with. And even if they don't come and pray, if they're just here, it's better than them being at the club. So let's be realistic, right? And, 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 and for the girls, you know, have lounges or places the girls can hang out at the masjid. Where they can just be by themselves and they can just do their homework there, talk to other Muslim girls there. So they're not at the mall. So they're not hanging out with non-Muslim girls. They have a safe refuge at the masjid. We have to start thinking like this because this is America, we need refuge. This is not Pakistan, because in Pakistan you would never think, uh, you know, somewhere to play at the masjid, astaghfirullah. How can that be? But here, we have to draw them in. We have to. If we don't, where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? So we have to start thinking, inshallah ta'ala, along these lines. May Allah Azza wa Jal make all of us sincere in our efforts. May Allah Azza wa Jal reward us for whatever little we get done. May Allah protect us and especially our youth and our future generations that they may become ambassadors of this deen and this land and make this a permanent fixture, make this land a land of Islam when the time comes inshaAllah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. InshaAllah ta'ala. If anybody has any comments or questions, I'd like to, uh, to I, I don't know if I have the answers for you, but I'd like to uh, open it up for you guys inshaAllah. Shukran lakum. Go ahead akhi. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I don't say to have separate schools actually. But the rest of it I did say. No, it's not. I disagree. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I disagree. Uh, the, the, the issue is, you know, when I say have separate youth groups, are we isolating them? And, you know, look, there's no isolating you from America. You're here. 
and there's, there's no way a child is not exposed to American culture. That's impossible. But at a, at a certain age, children are more susceptible to certain temptations. Before they reach certain maturity, they're more susceptible to danger than other ages. Teenagers are very emotional, hot-blooded. They give in to temptation very quickly, right? They get angry quickly, they get seduced quickly, they get excited quickly, right? They, everything happens very, very fast. This is the age where they're volatile. So we need, to be set, they ha we need to handle them with care, is what I'm suggesting. When they reach a certain age, then of course they have to be out in the real world. But if we took care of business at a certain age, then they should be responsible on their own. And you, can't, you can't shelter them their whole life. But at a certain age, we need to guard them. There's this Western mentality of, uh, or not even Western, it's a non-Muslim mentality, it's not a Western thing. Let the kids figure things out by themselves. They're smart enough, that's retarded. That's not, I mean, really, let kids figure out what things on their own? Have you seen what's out there, what the kids are up to? SubhanAllah, you know? So, so on the one hand, it's not, I'm not saying that we, we turn this into like, uh, you know, downtown Hyderabad or something. But what I am saying is, genders need to be separated for certain things. Facebook, my problem with it is, it's completely redrawn the lines of haya. So Muslim guys are getting on Facebook, and then some other girl from their MSA is also on their, she sends a message, can I be your friend? Already there's a very inappropriate line to click yes to, isn't it? So now she's your friend, because they're on the MSA together. And now, he's staring at her picture for five minutes. Nobody knows, it's on his laptop, nobody knows, right? I've seen this happen. I've seen it. guys. You know what they do? These brothers from the MSA. They'll go to the, their laptop. They'll hit up Facebook or MySpace or whatever, and then they'll look, stare at pictures of Muslim girls. Oh, she's cute. That one. Be my friend. That one. Be my friend. They're doing this, you know. And then we're saying, oh, we're isolating. <laughs> let's take a step back here. Let's let's be a little realistic. I mean, I don't. I you know. There are two extremes in our, in, our, in our community now. One that says, let's turn this into something, let's turn America into something it's not. And on the other, let's forget everything about Islam and it's America, let's, oh, it's all good. Let's, let's, let's find a balance here, you know. So, inshallah, that, that's at least that's what I'm suggesting. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Um, thanks for highlighting the problem. One more problem, we are self uh, uh, We are by self-responsible? I don't know what that means. Because only couple of people who have not dish at home. Oh, like dish, like dish TV you mean? Okay, I guess. Mostly people have dish and even their kids' room. Ugh. Uh, they, they're, they're watching Indian movies, if they're Indian, I suppose. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this is, this is actually a really serious problem. Uh, control of media intake. There are, some prob there are some works by Christian groups. Look, I'm a realist. I'm not going to tell you movies, watching movies is haram and listening to music is haram and you've heard this enough times already and it hasn't changed anything. So let's talk about it from a realistic point of view, okay? The realistic point of view is this. There are some Christian groups who have the same concerns as we do. They, they're concerned that their, their children are watching sexual content in certain movies and that they're, they're uh, exposed to explicit material, etc. And they've actually started developing programs like, for example, uh, there's a program called, I, I think, I don't know if it's still around, it's called Clean Flicks. Right? There's a Christian group that developed it. Which is basically movies that come out in theaters and, and stuff. They take all the filthy language out and the filthy scenes out, and they cut them out. And they make DVDs the clean, relatively clean version of that movie. Right? Now, this is what they're doing. I mean, these are Christians. They're not even Muslims. They're Christians. They're that realistic about this stuff. And I'm not saying endorse clean flicks. But I am saying our kids are watching stuff that they really shouldn't be watching. At a younger age, my suggestion is, this is at least something I do personally, it may or may not work for you. Our children, our children, we, uh, uh, we, uh, my wife and I, we, we get videos from the public library, like, you know, Dora episodes or, you know, Barney, you know, from the younger kids. Or, or even cartoons from older times, nowadays they're pretty disgusting, but older cartoons, we watch them the night before for censorship, and if they're okay, then they can watch that DVD the next day on Sesame Street or whatever. We don't let them watch live TV. We don't, because we don't know what's going to come on in the next second. We just, you just don't know. Right? You have a question or something? Uh, just, just a comment. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a national problem now. 
national yes, it is. They have warned about the parents and everybody. Yes, this is true. And there was a story in the Facebook also, the young girl hanged herself. Yeah. You don't know about it? The MySpace issue, yeah. Yeah, yeah the MySpace, yeah. No, this this is I mean actually there 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 are a few cases. There are a few cases like that. Even within the Muslim community I know of cases. I know of cases. But see, that's the thing. We need to raise awareness of this issue. And then you know how Allah says, What ta'awanu ala birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awanu ala ifmi wa udwan. Right? And then Allah calls us to cooperate with the people of the book, not in aqidah. But are there some concerns we share with them? There are. And in those things, this is a golden opportunity for da'wah. If we come up with solutions for youth, the problems in America, the problems our youth have are not Muslim problems, they're American problems. So the solutions we have to offer are not just solutions for us, who are they solutions for? Everybody. So this is a, me this is a doorway into the church, into the synagogue, to give da'wah to them and look at the solutions we have. Right? This is actually a doorway to that. So, solutions to marital problems. The Sunnah has the solutions to marital problems that no other religion has. They don't have what we have. So, I mean, even sharing this with the people of the book is a means of, of, of da'wah to them. And this you have to start thinking in, along these terms, inshallah. Akhi, you had a comment. I, I don't know how we can get to the sisters if they have any questions or comments. I guess they, they could pass them in writing or something. And then make a paper plane and then shoot it over. Inshallah, and then we could probably, we'll try to catch it. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is my this is my suggestion. I said one of the key jobs job openings in the Muslim community is what. Youth directors, here's the second key job opening. Uh, Muslim uh, psychotherapists, psychologists, Muslim uh, uh, social workers, uh, uh, Muslim pediat female pediatricians and male pediatricians that can give a health class to Muslim kids at the masjid. Instead of taking them taking a health class at high school or at the documentary that they're going to watch there, that they get it from the Muslims themselves, in a proper fashion, right? This is absolutely critical. It's absolutely critical. We don't have these resources right now. Now there are people that are doing this, but they're kind of doing it on their own. And the masajid are doing their thing and they're doing their thing. We need to find these people and we need to support them. We need to help them out. Because they're doing our work for us. They really are. So th these are the openings that we need to the create. They, the, the, uh, I don't know, you may find my comments controversial, Allahu A'lam, but I have to say what I'm convinced of. You don't have to take it. In my opinion, just because someone has a degree in Sharia does not mean they know how to deal with a teenager. Nor do they, does it mean that they know how to deal with somebody's family problems. Memorizing a bunch of a hadith does not mean you're a counselor. Counseling is something else. Quran and Sunnah is something else. The best form is when you have a scholar of Islam who is also a counselor. But just becoming a scholar of Islam doesn't necessarily turn you into a counselor. It doesn't necessarily make you capable of dealing with people's problems to the point where it may even be the case that you're an imam and you're a scholar but you have people problems in your own family. That happens too. That happens too. Why does it happen? Because we don't, we're not looking for those qualifications. Right now we have, we have, we have this problem of interaction with people. And it's, not, it's a certain kind of alim that we need. A alim that can deal with the family problems of the community. Right? This, is what we, this is the need of the hour. So our ulama, one of the things they need to do for, as a service to the ummah, is they need to study psychology. They need to study you know, family, family counseling. They need to become certified counselors, in addition to being ulama. So they can bring these two things together. Their knowledge of Quran and Sunnah, and the knowledge of how to deal with these kinds of things. Right? This is, this is absolutely critical. This is absolutely critical. And it's not happening for the most part. Very few things that are, you know, there are a handful of ulama that are psychologists. Handful. I could count them maybe, maybe on one hand. In the country. You know how many Islamic centers we have in the country? And how many people there are to talk? And just one thing, just to give some perspective, the projects that are going on that we should support, in my opinion, Nasiha Project. Remember this phrase, Nasiha Project. Okay? This is a group out of Canada. They started an 800 number that, you can, uh, that youth can call if they're having problems. Anonymous 800 hotline for Muslim youth that are having problems. They want to talk to somebody, right? 
So they started this hotline. They started it about a, almost a year ago and they put a documentary out after the first month of operation. In the first month, they got 20,000 phone calls. In the first month. And they took statistics on the phone calls they got, like this percent, like it was like 27% were talking about, uh, you know, having uh, relationships with a boy or a girl without their parents knowing. Some other, like 30% were talking about drug abuse. Some were talking about family abuse. So like, it was like 15, 16% of the calls they got were about suicidal teens. Suicidal Muslim teens. You know, at least now we know. And it feels bad to hear, but at least we know. We know, what, you know what's out there. So projects like that need to be funded. We need to support them. Because this is, this is the stuff we need. You know, and I'm embarrassed that happened in Canada. It should have happened here first. We should have come up with that first. But if it's there, we should support it. We should say, oh, you know, this is, this is what needs to be done. How do we help you? You know? So this is, I think, the direction the community has to now take. Our heads need to come together when this is a common concern. And I, I, I share this with you because, you know, Muslims come from all different parts of the world into the country. Our every masjid is so cosmopolitan. We have so many different backgrounds and thought processes and agendas, etc. Everybody's got their own agenda in the masjid. But this is one agenda we can all agree on. What do we do with our kids? That's one agenda nobody will disagree with. So let's unify ourselves on this one agenda, the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. What better agenda to unify on? And the masajid that have done that, whose primary concern is taking care of the needs of the youth, are masajid where the communities are flourishing. They're doing really, really well. You know? So inshallah ta'ala, may Allah give that ability to all of our masajid and help solve some of these problems for us, bi idnihi, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright. Okay, last one, inshallah. Yaku. Okay, uh, it depends on their age. Well, what do you do about children who are good in front of you and bad behind you? Know who their friends are, number one. Know where, who their friends are, who their parents are, where they live, go to their house, be friends with their parents. Parents should know their friends' friends' parents. Why? Because if they're getting together and getting in trouble, who's going to gang up on them? All the parents together. That needs to happen. If, you're, if your children know that my dad knows your dad, then they'll be more in line. Relatively more. It's not a fail-safe, but it's relatively more in check. Because they can, they can tell you false stories about, oh, we were over there, his dad knows. Well, I know his dad, and you weren't there. Right? So you see what I'm saying? So this is absolutely critical. We need to know our, the, the parents of our children's friends. This is absolutely critical. Okay? This is the first thing. The second thing is, uh, when it comes to our children acting a certain way with us, and another way with, with, uh, with others, it really, in the end, boils down to who their friends are. And this is a hadith I didn't share with you, but it's, it's at the center of this problem. الْمَرْءُ عَلَىٰ دِينِ خَلِيلِهِ فَلْيَنْظُرْ أَحَدُكُمْ مَنْ يُخَالِدْ Okay? أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ A person depends on the religion of their friend. A person depends on the religion of their friend. Then watch out who you make friends with. So in other words, by extension, watch out who your kids make friends with. Watch out. Because your friends, your kids will do good things or bad things depending on what? Who their friends are. Who their friends are. So that's your primary concern. That's why I say give the masjid life. So their friends are at the youth group at the masjid. And you know all of their parents. This is your refuge. Start here. This is the best place to start. Inshallah. Pardon? Could you make it a complete sentence so I know what you're saying? Yes, we do. Absolutely. We should know what uh, Muslim kids are more messed up than non-Muslim kids sometimes. So just because you're, you know, your, 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 friend's, uh, your, your boy's friend is uh, you know, Abdul Karim, that doesn't mean that he's a great kid. You know, Abdul Karim could be pretty jacked up. He could, you know, <laughs> he could be, <laughs> you know. So, uh, inshallah, ta'ala, I'm going to take one last written question and then we can talk personally, inshallah, I'm around, but my throat can't take much more. Okay, uh, brother, assalamu alaikum. Please ask the parents to be with, with the times, oh, be with the times, and should be concerned with what's going on in the kid's life. I thought I did. Um, I saw missed guys with shorts on Facebook. None of, no, I can't read your... None of the mothers probably know about it, oh, because they think they have joined a Muslim program. 
This is just to let you know the state of affairs of Muslim youth. Yeah, uh, you know, me, you could knock on mist or whatever, but at least those kids showed up to mist. That's how I look at it. Really. Because if they didn't show up to mist, guess what else they could be, they could be doing? So instead of criticizing uh, 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 mist, get involved with mist, fix it up. <coughs> so write letters to mist and say, this is what I think the problem is, and this is how I think I can help. Don't just tell them the problem, help. And this is not just a mist, mass youth, YM, MSA, whatever it is, whatever program is going on, don't just tell me what their problems are, help. These are Muslim organizations, volunteers, these are not endless resources, they're doing what